So virax actually is Latin for truth teller. Uh, and, and it is one of the code names that Edward Snowden used when he um, uh, communicated with the Washington Post. So this is a book primarily about whistleblowers, not all whistleblowers, but those working on the issue of mass surveillance and on drones. Um, and probably I would imagine that all of you has, who, who here has heard of Edward Snowden? All of you. So the story that Edward Snowden uh, told, which is recounted in this book, and we'll walk you through some of it, is an important one, but it's only half the story. The story that most people are concerned about is the fact that the US government is, is conducting mass surveillance and watching all of us. You know, if you have a cell phone, if you have an email, if you use a link card or a BART card, the government can keep track of you because they hack into all of the electronic systems that we use. But in reality, there's a bigger and more important story behind that, which Snowden started to tell but never finished. And we're hoping this book will tell you about that. So they're not following us purely because um, they want to keep tabs on us and track down dissidents. That is, of course, a, a, a possible uh, and dangerous outcome of collecting all of our data. But the main reason they're doing that, and this is what they claim, I'm, I'm, I'm perhaps doing the Pentagon favors by saying what I say, the reason they say they're following all of our electronic data is because they want to find terrorists. And so they believe that if they map all of our emails, they'll be able to drill down and find people to kill. And so this book is more than about the invasion of your privacy. It's really about the individuals that they have killed. And there are probably in excess of 6,000 people who have been killed using drones and mass surveillance. And so this is a story that goes beyond looking into our email and looking into people who have died in countries like Pakistan, Afghanistan, and Yemen. But most importantly, it's not just about those people who have died, but it's about the people that have spoken out against it. And so before I turn over to Khalil and we walk through the book, we'll walk you through the images in the book, I want to say a word about these specific whistleblowers. Edward Snowden's one of them. And he, in fact, is a good example because he, you know, he went straight, he, he really didn't go to college. You know, he was somebody who sort of dropped out of, of, he didn't go to Harvard, he didn't go to Stanford, he didn't go to any big schools. You know, he may be a very famous person today, but he didn't go to, you know, these important universities. Well, the main subject of the people in this book are people who actually mostly graduated from high school, and they're all soldiers. These are young people who age 18, because there's a draft in this country, it's an economic draft. They're people who, um, when they finished high school, found that they could get a job working in the US military, and if they did four to six years, they would get college, and then they would get uh, veterans benefits down the road. So they joined up to fight, oftentimes because they were from rural America, because they thought they were fighting a war against terrorism. And what they discovered when they found out about mass surveillance and about drones, they found that they were targeting ordinary people like themselves with bad technology who had no opportunity to speak for themselves on the other side of the world. So this book is actually dedicated to those young soldiers, uh, veterans now, and they're all veterans, you know, starting age 25. I, you know, I'm in my 50s, so I, it's funny when I talk to these kids and I say, you're veterans, and they, you know, they're less than half my age, but they're speaking out, and this book is dedicated to them. So um, without and the, any further and, and the other truth tellers, all the, and the, the other truth, truth tellers, tellers yes. yeah. Originally, hi, I'm, I'm Khalil, and I'm also very thrilled to be here tonight with you. Seattle is one of my favorite cities. Uh, yeah, when I came up with the idea originally to, I, I was inspired by the whistleblowers. Uh, before Snowden, there was uh, Bradley Manning, now Chelsea Manning, wanted to do a book on, on the whistleblowers. And when Edward Snowden came up with his revelations, I called ProTap because I knew ProTap, it was his beat. He knew Assange, Julian Assange, and all those people. I thought we've got to do a book together, and he ex accepted. So. We started out doing more of the whistleblowers, the Edward Snowdens, and the, the journalists, courageous journalists like Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald, who actually put the, themselves on the line too. They, you'll see in the book what they had to go through to just reveal uh, this kind of story to, that New York Times, Washington Post are not interested in. Uh, so it started out, about half of the book is about their experience. They, they know, ProTap knows 
knows them except he never met Snowden himself, but he knows Laura. Uh, and then the, the, the rest of the book is really about Protap's work. I told him, Protap, you gotta be in the book, you're gonna be one of the protagonists. I had to uh, drag him a little bit into the book. And we follow his investigations, his investigative work, following the trail of this mass surveillance. What does it do? He, you'll see in the book one of the early experiences that really motivated him to go more into the drone warfare uh, story was that he met this young Pakistani who was uh, 50, 16 years old and it was a conference that where Pakistanis were already complaining about these drone strikes killing innocent people. So he's there having dinner with him. They're talking about soccer and having a good time. And three days, was it three days or three weeks? Three days later, Protap hears that this poor kid had been also killed by a drone strike. So that kind of motivated him, gave him some extra motivation to go and find out what is this drone warfare? Why are they killing people like this? Is it out of sheer incompetence? Is it out of malice? What is it? Why are they killing innocent people? So that's the book, in, in essence. It's about all these truth tellers, whether they be whistleblowers uh, like Snowden or people less well known, the veterans that you've met and, and talked to, who are traumatized but with, but by what they're doing, even though they're not exposing themselves directly, physically, to warfare. They're in a base in Nevada and pushing a button, but they don't like it. It doesn't sit well with them. They have PTSD. So these truth-tellers, the, the, the whistleblowers, and the journalists also, because it takes some guts in this country, or any country, really, to speak truth to power. So we're going to show you some of the pages that we together produced. Um, not in any particular, I mean, it's, it's not going to be sequ uh, consecutive pages, but it'll show you a little bit the, the work we, we did together in this book. Okay, yeah, so this is the prologue. You see okay. somewhere in Central Asia, you see a drone there, a predator drone, flying over this uh, mountain in Afghanistan. Some kids playing soccer, they hear the thing. Uh, a baby hears the, the noise, it's, it's really very traumatizing more than we imagine, even if you're not shot by one of these things, if you're constantly subjected to the noise, just the noise itself drives you crazy because first of all, you worry that they might shoot you from up there. And second of all, it's unbearable. It's just a really a very traumatic thing. Um, here we see the other side of it in, in a base maybe in, in Nevada, looking at these kids playing soccer, looking at that guy with his baby who can't stand the noise, seeing it from his point of view, and then we see the whole operation, <laughs> all these people watching them from a distance. That's the prologue. Then we introduce Protap Chatterjee, my version of Protap, <laughs> uh, in London. This was in 2011. You want to read some of the... Some uh, sure. So the so essentially, this is really about my, uh, I had uh, left the US, I, I live in Berkeley in the Bay Area, as does Khalil, and I was hired to work for the Bureau of Investigative Journalism at, at City University, where I actually went to journalism school. And uh, they hired me, uh, and the beat that I wanted to cover was mass surveillance. And this is, remember, years before Edward Snowden came out, this is 2010, that I had started working for them, no, 2011, sorry. And so I had a hard time convincing my editor, Ian Overton, um, about this esoteric subject of software. You know, who are the companies, who are the, uh, what is the technology that is used to track people? Because back in those days, which is seven years ago, nobody believed that the government was following you or could really collect all this information uh, from your phone and your email. So I thought you were going to read your own lines, but you're, oh, oh. <laughs> that's okay. We'll go on to the next page. So here's a, a, one of the meetings that where Protap uh, met. He met him several times and knows him quite well. Junior Nassange, along with other uh, journalists in Europe. So here Assange is talking about, essentially, about this, this big uh, annual, what would you call it, uh, a trade show. It's called Millpole that happens in Paris, where all the big um, 
the big uh, intel companies are selling their wares. So Melipal actually sends some military and police. And so this happens every year in Paris. And then they have uh, uh, events in Abu Dhabi too, in which they, uh, industry sells riot gear. They sell um, uh, software. They sell you know, tear gas. Uh, and it is a convention, you can see it right here, um, where what, what, that, what are called lawful in, uh, interception agencies, LIA, come and buy equipment they can use to track their own population. And so these are people who come from the United States, police forces here, uh, um, militaries or, or, or government agencies from Egypt to Syria, and I think we might even see a bit yeah. of that. You can see there's some Israeli companies here, there's some Saudi clients there. It's, a, it's the whole world coming and, and a lot of uh, rather uh, not so democratic systems that are extremely attracted to this stuff, like uh, Sirius Assad and Mubarak and all those people are really interested in this stuff. They use it against their own people. So this is where, after this page, where you talk about, Assange basically gave you a tip about this big conference and told you, you know, you're going to learn a lot of stuff there. And here we see ProTap at the, the big station in uh, London, the train station. Um, King's Cross. King's, yeah. you, do you want me no, to read it? Uh, if you I could want. try to read it. Sure. <laughs> Ten years of reporting on the war on terror from Baghdad to Kabul had taught me that spying for national security had become a booming business. So here you see me. Well, I think you guys can see, see what's happening. So Assange's uh, classified briefing suggested that he'd been able to identify some of the key players, and I had little reason to doubt him. From the first time I emailed him back in 2009, he's always come up with astonishing and accurate revelations, which gave journalists from the New York Times to the UK Guardian irrefutable proof of egregious US war crimes, and put a bullseye on Julian's back. Every Western government wanted him silenced. But Julian was equally determined to continue to expose the abuses of the national security state. And then this is the, the kid we were talking about, that uh, Tariq, Aziz. Tariq Aziz, who was shot. And here, Protap is uh, interacting with uh, this uh, lawyer in Pakistan whose job is to try to, to reveal all these, these terrible things that are happening and, and swept under the rug. And they're trying to figure out which one of the kids, because there were a number of, of uh, Pakistani kids at that event. Who is Tariq? Are you talking about this Tariq or that Tariq? And finally, they, f they remember the ProTap here was able to identify him just by looking at the photos. And here it tells him, uh, and so, yeah, so he sends him the photo and, uh, uh, what was his name again? Tariq Aziz. No, no, this yeah. guy. Um, Shazad. Shazad, Shazad. Shazad. Is this a correct Tariq Shahzad? He says, yes, this is the boy who was killed. He was just 16. So here we see uh, Protap with Laura Poitras after that, after one of the meetings with uh, Assange. Sure, so Laura Poitras, whom some of you may have heard of, actually she lived in Seattle, I think, for a, a period of time, uh, briefly. Um, uh, she, she had been making a series of films, the, an, uh, a trilogy of films about the war on terror. And the first film, as, ex, as, as she says in this thing, the, uh, the, the first film was about Iraqis, I forget the name of the film, under US occupation. The second was about a Yemeni man imprisoned in Guantanamo. And her plan at that time was to film the whistleblowers, but not the whistleblowers I told you about, not the soldiers, and not Edward Snowden, whom she hadn't met at the time, but she wanted to talk to people at the NSA who were actually, there's a group called the NSA4, Bill Binney, Ed Loomis, uh, Thomas, Drake. Uh, uh, Thomas Drake, and uh, Jay w uh, Work, um, um, I forget his name, uh, the, uh, uh, Jay Kirk Wiebe is his name. So the four of them had been speaking out, but to actually a very small audience of, of experts and saying, you know, the NSA is using this technology, but they had no real proof. They said, we worked there, we left the NSA, and we want people uh, to know that the go your government is spying on you. And most people didn't believe them because it was based on, on their word. They had no documents to prove it. And they are featured in the book quite a bit. And they're the ones who really inspired Edward Snowden. 
to to come out as well yeah. because he saw these people who were really very ethically and, and courageously minded and they just did their thing regardless of the consequences for them their career for their their lives and um, I don't know if, uh, if you've seen any of you have seen the the movie uh, Citizen, Citizen Four, Four by Laura and yeah so. But why it's Citizen, Citizen Four? Because Snowden keeps saying, you know, if, if, if they get me, there'll be four other guys. There'll always be another four. And at the end of one of the last pages, we show, show him saying that, yeah, you know, they can get me, but there'll be another four guys coming out. So, <laughs> so they're wasting their time, essentially. So here is Thomas Drake. Imagine for the moment having your, your very home raided by the FBI. Imagine having your family pictures, books, personal papers, and computers seized and taken away. Imagine finding yourself without a job or a future and threatened with prospect of life in prison. Imagine the government doing everything to isolate you from your family, your five sons, your friends, your colleagues. Is that freedom? The government regards me as an enemy of the state. I have formally raised grave concerns about government wrongdoing through proper channels. We now live in an Orwellian world where whistleblowing is equated with espionage. And Obama, incidentally, we miss him now, of course, because of Trump, but <laughs> it was Obama who raised the bar. He's the one who, who uh, tried more people under espionage, the Espionage Act, than all presidents before him combined. So, and this is Edward Snowden uh, making his re famous revelations from the, the Mira Hotel in Hong Kong. He says, the NSA routinely lies in response to congressional inquiries about the scope of surveillance in America. So Glenn Greenwald asked him, is it possible to put security in place to protect against state surveillance? The extent of her capabilities is horrifying. By the way, all the whole book is nonfiction. I think you've, you understand that from day one. And there are no words here that we've put in people's mouths. These are the exact quotes. Um, we can plant bugs and machines once you, uh, once you go on the network. I can identify your machine. You will never be safe whatever protection you put in place. You are not even aware of what is possible. We hack everyone everywhere. So Glenn asks him, what do you think is going to happen to you? He says, nothing good, but I couldn't do this without accepting the risk of prison. Here again, a, a day later, maybe a day into the revelations, he's still in the, in the hotel. And Glenn, Glenn has been spreading the word worldwide, he comes into the room and says, hey, Glenn, it's everywhere. I watched your interviews. Every, everyone seemed to get it. Nobody knows. This is the very tip of the iceberg. What's next and when? The prison program tomorrow. And he gets an email from uh, Janine Gibson at the UK Guardian. She says, Glenn, the Post has just, the Washington Post has just published their prison story. We have to publish ours now. So there's sort of a, a, a race to publish stuff because the Washington Post, which is part of the establishment, is trying to steal the limelight from the UK Guardian, which is a lot more independent. And uh, here, Glenn is saying so much for national, so-called national security concerns. They want to get to set the agenda with their favorite newspaper. So that's what the government traditionally has done. They work together with the Post, with the New York Times, to keep, to keep information under wraps, essentially. And here's the, the suspense. It was very interesting how, what they had to go through that night before they finally published the, the most damning stuff. He's, he's communicating with Janine Gibson, the editor, the US editor of the UK Guardian, not the top editor. And you can see this in the book. It's just really quite interesting how until the last second they didn't know that they would get the stuff out in time and in correct fashion. I mean, full-blown revelations. And here, um, maybe you can tell us about what's going on so here. This is uh, Snowden's uh, flight from Hong Kong when he realized, in fact, that uh, he would not be protected. He assumed that when he arrived in Hong Kong that he would be protected by the Hong Kong authorities because his assumption was that uh, Hong Kong has always stood up to the government of China, which is uh, uh, um, uh, uh, perhaps a mistaken assumption, but most importantly, the 
Hong Kong authorities said, we cannot protect you from US authorities, but if you want to leave, this is up to you. So together with Sarah Harrison from WikiLeaks, he fled uh, 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 to, uh, he hoped to Ecuador, but in fact, as, as, as you probably well know, he ended up getting stuck in between in Moscow. So we see him taking off uh, on an Aeroflot uh, flight uh, to Ecuador. Via Moscow. Via Moscow. And you get stuck in, in, in Russia and on the way. <laughs> it just so happened that that same time there was this big conference of gas exporting countries where um, Evo Morales, president of Bolivia, happened to be. And he was suspected of, he was sympathetic to Edward Snowden. So the U.S. thought that perhaps on his plane, Edward Snowden might be hiding. <laughs> so they just ignored the fact this is the, the head of a sovereign country. And they just basically hijacked the plane. The plane couldn't refuel anywhere except where they wanted it to refuel. And that's what we're showing here. And Mr. Morales was not pleased at all. Humiliated and nothing could do because all the European countries were going along with, with uh, Washington's uh, agenda. agenda. So this is an interesting, amusing uh, episode. So here we're back in Nevada, where you would think that Nevada has nothing to do with Yemen or with Afghanistan, but a lot of it is happening from there. Uh, this is an artistic depiction of uh, uh, a, a document that was released by the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties uh, Union. And so even though the book is a book of nonfiction and everything is true, uh, some of these we had to uh, yeah. imagine okay. what happened. We don't know but what they look like. We don't know what the soldiers <laughs> look like. Uh, but this is actually a true story of a strike that took place in February of 2010. So it's not the actual transcript of the conversation between all these diff different and you can, people. You can get this online. It's an 80-page document in which they are attempting to find so there, there, are there are two aspects to drones. One is to f track quote unquote terrorists and the other is something called overwatch. And the idea behind overwatch is soldiers are supposed to look out for uh, people on the ground that they might need to protect. So in this particular case, they're looking out over a group of special forces soldiers on the ground in Uruzgan, Afghanistan. And so their job is to track them and to make sure that if anything happens uh, to them, they should they they are able to intervene. So because if you're if you're uh, driving along or walking along in a forest, you can't see what's happening around the next hill. So uh, trackers in Nevada watch from these remote control drones, and it's their job to spot anybody that might be coming around the corner and atta to attack you. Now, because even though you're following a soldier on the ground, you don't necessarily know who's coming. This actually betrays the the quality of the footage that uh, the drone uh, 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 planes uh, really can observe, they often make mistakes. And we use this as an example. It's the only full transcript of a strike, a drone strike, in which they show the pilots talking to each other, conversing and saying, is that a woman? Is that a child? Are there is any that guns? a gun? That, there was, um, are, are there any a guns? A shovel on the truck that or might be a shovel? gun, that might be a shovel, because it's a metallic object. And so you see here, he says, they called a possible weapon and a military-aged man mounted in the back of the truck. But the reality is, in fact, and as we've heard personally, I've heard personally from the whistleblowers, actually the quality of the image is actually very poor. Because remember, a drone is transmitting video across the world in real time, and it is, it is beholden to, at the time, uh, a speed of a couple of megabytes per second, and, it's got, and they've got to make a split-second decision especially when they're looking out over soldiers whom they think might be attacked at any moment. So they gave the command to fire. I don't know what else you have lined yeah. up here. So uh, uh, here they're talking about possible child. Not sure. Is it a child? Is it not a child? Next page, they actually take the hit. Just uh, and, a sweet, and the guy, one of them, is actually pleases himself, says, sweet f***ing target. Jeez. Lead vehicle on the run and bring the hellos in. Boom. Take a look at this one. It was hit pretty good. It's a little toasty. And the other one's not so sure. Wow. And you can see in the transcript that they're celebrating this hit. That truck is so dead. Later, this is one of the soldiers uh, with PTSD that ProTap so we, we should, we should pause a second because mm. you'll see in the book 
they, the soldiers discover, uh, and, uh, these are real soldiers, within a few seconds, when women come out and start waving, uh, you know, uh, handkerchiefs white, in white, the air, white, white scarves, yeah. they realize they've killed innocent people. And in fact, there was an, in the reason we know is there was a US military investigation into this, and that investigation revealed the fact that they'd in fact hit three vehicles of civilians, and there was not a single person that was uh, uh, trying to kill the soldiers. In fact, they were just farmers on their way to market. So I, th I think this page is quite uh, revealing in, in, in terms of the, 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 the feelings these guys have. So pro tap, you say, Sean, Sean Westmoreland, hi, Sean. Thanks for th talking to me about drones. What was your role in the, f in the program? Says, I was an Air Force radio technician. I helped build the communications infrastructure for the US military's drone program in Afghanistan. And you have PTSD from these strikes? Says, yes. I have nightmares of a child next to me, ash-covered body, and, and looking at me as if I had done it. Were you directly involved in drone strikes? He says, technically, no. My job was to perform diagnostics on all the equipment, so why the trauma? Well, the responsibility for killing a person is divided, so nobody feels the full responsibility. You have imagery analysts, the commander, and the pilots. But I believe that all parties involved are responsible for every, everything the drone program does. To say otherwise would mean that nobody is responsible, and that the act of killing is devoid of morality. This is another world I am willing to live in. I refuse to avert my attention from my role in this machine of death and ruined lives. If, if there was any way I could stop this war and apologize for what I've done, I would. And we see two little kids have been killed by a drone strike. Uh, other whistleblowers that you met in New York. Sure, so uh, I met a total of about nine drone whistleblowers. These are a couple of... Uh, guys uh, who have now disappeared, essentially. Because uh, many of these kids, age 25, they graduate from the military. Uh, they, as, as you'll see, and, 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 and we can read from this, th there's this guy in the middle. I'm Stephen Lewis from Texas. He actually worked for the CIA. And then there's Michael Haas, who is a drone trainer. And he lived in Elko, Nevada. Uh, curiously, in fact, we had that in common because I've spent some time in Elko with my friend Greg back there. So we chatted about uh, Elko, and he, he told me about how growing, growing up in rural America, and he, he, you know, he joined this military that he thought was protecting Americans, was protecting Americans, and he realized, in fact, as he did this, that he was, he was doing something that was deeply, deeply problematic. And so, as you'll see there, he says, I was pretty fucked up when I was, when I was deployed. I did bath salts. There was a lot of coke. Everyone drank. We used to call alcohol drone fuel because it kept the program going. It was everywhere. You start to do these psychological gymnastics to make it easier to do what you have to do. They deserved it, you say. They chose their side. You had to kill part of your conscience to keep doing your job every day and to ignore those voices telling you this wasn't right. Um, and in fact, after, after the program, I haven't heard from him in a while. A lot of these people, a lot of these kids um, uh, just you know, uh, uh, end up killing themselves, quite a number of, I don't know if it will show. But they're running out of these. Uh, you would think it's an easy job to fill. A lot of people need jobs. They just don't have enough drone pilots. People are just running away, running away from these openings. They know how hard it can be uh, psychologically. And ProTab, by the way, uh, managed the amazing feat of getting an editorial in the New York Times about this stuff. Op-ed. Op-ed, sorry. <laughs> Op-ed, no, op no. opinion editorial. Okay. Um, yeah, and it's shown in the, in the book how he managed that feat. <laughs> uh, so here you, you have a Yemeni uh, relative of a, a drone victim. Tells so, yeah, so th this is an interesting a episode. Uh, Laura uh, put on an event at the Whitney Museum uh, in, in New York, and in which uh, I, I helped a little bit with this. Uh, uh, we brought together, well, really reprieve brought together. Uh, I came up with the idea. Tell them who Reprieve is. So Reprieve is an NGO in England, and it's their job. They have made it their job. It was started by a guy by the name of Clive Stafford Smith. And what Clive has done is defended. First, he started out. He worked in Louisiana, and he worked in Alabama and Mississippi, where he defended people on death row. And then he transitioned from that to defending people 
on a much bigger death row that is Guantanamo. And they're personally actually represented about 8% uh, of, of 8 to 10 percent of the victims in Guantanamo and gotten a lot of them out. Now they're working with Shahzad Akbar in Pakistan to defend people in Yemen and Pakistan whose uh, relatives have been killed by drones. So Faisal, uh, who now lives in Montreal, is one of their clients. And his um, um, nephew and brother-in-law, if I remember right, were killed in a drone strike. So during the wedding. During a wedding. Uh, so this is the tale of the two of them, uh, uh, of, of Faisal speaking out. And I don't know if you'll see this, but what happens at this event is I arranged for one of the whistleblowers to meet uh, this, the family member of two people who were killed. And it was actually very, very emotional. I've participated in a few of these events, and everybody ends up in tears, where essentially you're introducing the executioner to the family of the executed. Uh, and it's, you know, the, there was, the, some of this was filmed, and it, the television station actually never ended up airing it. And it would end up being very traumatic for everybody concerned. So we'll keep... Uh, and here was showing part of the interview. That's, uh, this uh, this I, I drew from an actual interview uh, that was videotaped. He says that he was offered $100,000 for, what, two lives, right? And he wasn't interested in the money. <laughs> he says, we are holding on to the money in our quest for justice for a public apology. Faisal and Protap intervened and says, Faisal, how hard was it for you to enter the United States given the government won't meet with you? And the, the, the interviewer says, Faisal has quite the tale to tell about that. Faisal, could you share what happened with you uh, when you arrived at JFK two nights ago? And then we, we have that story. This is another incident in Yemen as well, right? So yeah, uh, just, uh, just to, not to give away the entire book. Yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't give away the entire book. Uh, it, you'll see when you, read, when you buy and read the book what happens when he enters the U.S. and he meets the immigration authorities and they say, why are you here? And he says, I'm here to talk about a drone strike. You'll see the reception. It's actually quite interesting how he's treated. He's treated by the, uh, uh, by, uh, the immigration officials. But we'll skip ahead because you've got to read the book uh, and to uh, this event, which actually brings us into 2017. In 2017, this is literally a couple of weeks after Donald Trump uh, was inaugurated, and he gives the order for the first drone strike to go in uh, into a place called Yakla in Yemen. Yeah. So, so we see some of the the victims, also the relatives of victims. This little kid, Al Jazeera. This is some of the the destruction. It, uh, the the caption says it didn't go as planned. Back to Al Jazeera. This little girl here, an eight-year-old, uh, actually, it's uh, Obama killed her, killed a 15-year-old, 16-year-old American in Yemen. Trump just killed his eight-year-old uh, sister. So it's getting worse. <laughs> this is uh, a These post are the two by children of Anwar al -Laki. Yeah, this was a post by Glenn Greenwald in, in the Intercept. Uh, I don't know if how many of you have heard of the Intercept. It's a yeah. It's a new media, very important. There's Glenn Greenwald and Laura, I think, sometimes uh, contributes. No, anymore, but, she but, started. Yeah, but other investigative journalists are there. This guy here with the, count found, uh, the Council of Foreign Relations explains how during President Obama's two terms in office, he approved 542 such targeted attacks in 2,920 days, one every 5.4 days, from his inauguration through today, President Trump has approved at least 75 drone strikes or raids in 74 days, about one in every 1.25 days. So it's getting worse. And here towards the end, we, we reveal that, what the meaning of <laughs> VRAX is re really about. But we're talking, Pratap's talking about how, um, yeah, more and more people are coming out of the woodwork. Snowden once said, they can stomp on me if they want, but there will be seven more to take my place, not four, seven more. And this is uh, one of the pages where we quote Chelsea Manning, who I thought made a very appropriate quote. You want to read it? Uh, sure. Right so this is actually the last page of the book, and it says uh, Chelsea Manning, on an interview after she was released from prison, uh, I think spoke on ABC, or one of the television stations, I can't remember which one, 
And she says, we're getting all this information, the, ma the information from mass surveillance, from following people's phone calls and emails and using drones, and from all these different sources, and it's just death, destruction, mayhem. We're filtering all the, through facts, statistics, reports, <laughs> dates, times, locations, and eventually we just stop. I stopped just seeing statistics and information and started seeing people. I have a responsibility to the public. We all have a responsibility. And so in some ways, we use that as an exhortation at the end of the book because we hope that it will be a call out to whistleblowers, those you know, working in the military you know, who uh, this book profiles to speak out against you know, the illegal and immoral war that has uh, killed so many innocent people. To all true <laughs> truth tellers everywhere. <laughs> so we'd love to answer any questions you may have for us. And and oops, and if you get the book, there's actually a lot of illustrations of of the how uh, uh, mass surveillance uh, is conducted. And we we, di we divide. Um, this is my little uh, thing. We divide surveillance into tracking, uh, hacking, mass surveillance, and analysis. And so we explain. Uh, the, the, the system and how the U.S. uses to track people and why it goes wrong. And how, despite the fact that they have all this information, the information that uh, Edward Snowden spoke about, it actually allows them, in, in fact, results in them jumping to the wrong conclusions. Just because you have data on people doesn't mean you know actually what's happening and what they're doing. And so one of the important conclusions of the book and the conclusions of certainly my wor work is that technology can never replace justice. So you may have information about people, but especially if you haven't given them uh, the ability to defend themselves, you don't know the whole story. And so to be able to make decisions you know, from Nevada or, or New Mexico or California and people's lives on the other side of the world is actually not just a tragedy. Uh, it is, in fact, you know, I, I think, a, a, um, it's counterproductive, blowbacks and all that. So it comes, that it comes right, today. boom, rings on us here in this country as well, fortunately. You have so, a question. Okay. Yeah, so with the um, ongoing horror in Yemen and especially the confusion in Niger right now, do you think there's a part of the world or a field of operations that hasn't been given attention or do you think is something that's been overlooked? Well, when Snowden came out with his revelations, there was quite a... a, a a shock wave th worldwide, places like Germany, places like Brazil, places like France, who were, whose governments were really embarrassed because it showed that even allies, supposed allies, were being spied on, and spied on very thoroughly. So I don't think there's a personally. I don't know about you, Protab. I don't think there's a corner of the world well, that's immune. Well, North right. Korea, but apart from North Korea, <laughs> the U.S. may not be able to tap their emails and cell phones since they don't really have emails and cell phones, but. If the question was about whether or not uh, uh, the U.S. government or, or people with access to technology, is, is there any part of the world that they cannot spy on? Is that, was that the question? Or? More that maybe the public isn't aware of in terms of our involvement or national So uh, our, our book isn't really about that, but there are some really excellent uh, writers on that topic. Uh, Bill Blum, William Blum, some of you may know of him, and also Nick Terse uh, has written a couple of books about um, the, A, the, the history of US uh, war uh, in countries around the world, and I think it, it adds up to something like yeah, 80 on, countries or so. On our website, we have, sor uh, we have uh, access to a lot of those, uh, those other, other sources. Yeah. And that Nick mm. Terse points out that there's 120 countries in which the US has mil a military presence. One thing we didn't talk about tonight, but you'll see in the book, is that they talk about the five eyes. Are anybody, any, any of you familiar with that concept, the any five of you eyes? Five eyes? No. The five okay. eyes are these, uh, not just allies, but really closely imbricated into, into our system of you know, national security. You have the five Anglo-Saxon countries. You have the UK, the US, Canada, Australia, and, and New Zealand. Those are very closely um, associated with our, our um, so they, security. So they share intelligence. They share intelligence in uh, on a routine basis. And there's nothing that an, um, a Londoner can do that we don't know and vice versa. I mean, what we're doing here, London knows about because those five eyes are all 
uh, very close together in terms of security arrangements. Mm. Let's see. Okay. Do you have any suggestions for certain software programs that help to prevent being tracked? Or? I'm glad you asked that. And actually, as, as, uh, on our website, we have, uh, in addition to these pages which you just saw, we also have a, a resource section, take action. And under that, we, we break out three different ways you can do it. One is um, a way you can encrypt your browser uh, using the Tor project. Uh, the second is uh, if you're sending messages uh, uh, from your cell phone using Signal, that's a good way uh, to do it. You can also use uh, 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 encrypted um, uh, 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 anonymous search, and that's using either DuckDuckGo or um, what was the second? Uh, uh, or, or start page. Those are the two things. So we provide links to each of those technologies that you can use. I mean, the reality is that if you use uh, a computer or a cell phone, there there is a chance uh, that, and, and Julian Assange actually recently put out uh, something called Vault 7, which we mentioned at the end of the book, under which it shows that even if you use those kind of anonymizing software, mm -hmm. if they've gotten to the root of your machine, uh, it doesn't really matter because they can track everything you do. They can uh, track uh, every keystroke that you do. So if you want to do something uh, that you don't want the government to know about, you'd be well advised not to put it. Uh, use a typewriter. To, to <laughs> use a typewriter. <laughs> and, and in fact, in, fact in, in Germany, post Snowden's revelations, they did switch, I don't know for how long, to a system of uh, of, of communicating by a pneumatic tune, where instead of having information typed out and sent by, by phone, really secret information was sent by a technology that's 100 years old. Um, so the reality is anything can be intercepted if it's electronic. Uh, there's almost no real, real way of uh, being able of, of protecting yourselves. The best way is, is to meet in person, as we're doing right now. Unfortunately, of course, free speech TV is recording this, so now everybody knows our secrets. So, <laughs> but, uh, there's no escape. Uh, there's no escape um, in, in that sense. Um, and if you do use Tor, do, do they know that you're using Tor, and would they try to track you in some other way more so? so? That's, a, that's okay. a good question. The, the, uh, if they're following, <laughs> let's suppose the government is following you, right? And the government, uh, is able to gather your traffic. They will know that you're using Tor. That is possible. Last I checked with the Tor developers, it is not possible to hide the fact that you're using Tor. However, they will not be able to see what you're looking at. So, uh, uh, and of course, you could use Tor, let's say, at an internet cafe, or you could, you know, buy a burner phone and and throw it away, but. Uh, my understanding, uh, and nothing is ever guaranteed, is that they cannot track, uh, they cannot, if you're using Tor, they cannot see what you're looking at. But they may know that you're, and there's a reason for that. When you use Tor, basically what it does is it, it scrambles your, your, your traffic and it bounces it around the world. The very fact that your traffic is bouncing around the world is an indication that you're using software that is encrypting your uh, traffic. So it is possible to know that you're using it it is not necessarily possible if you're using Tor to know what you're looking at. So, uh, so if they're not looking at you in the first place um, and you're using Tor, there's not something that automatically signals then that pe who, everybody who's using Tor, though? No, uh, they would okay. have to want to follow you. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that would, be, that would be pretty hard for them to do. Okay, thank you. More, more questions? Yes. Oh, yep. This is really meaningful work that you're doing, obviously, and thank, thank you. you for sharing it. Um, I had a question about um, the discussion that you were having with a person who is an operator with drone systems, but not directly. Is uh, this, Sean, yeah. yeah, is this the way that, um, is this the format where this is the whistleblowing format right now, or is has he told his story to other individuals, or is this kind of the first No, no, no so Sean has actually spoken out quite a bit, and you could Google him, Sean Westmoreland. So once again, in, on, uh, by the book, but the, the website, which is free to use, has a, a section uh, of resources, and in that we have links to each of the whistleblowers, or not directly to each of them, obviously, but the stories they've told. So there are actually several links, probably three or four links of Sean 
who is the radio technician that we, we showed and where he's spoken out. Uh, so uh, each of the, there are nine drone whistleblowers uh, that are profiled in this book and there's a, there's a section in which each of their stories, uh, there are links to each of their stories as well as the five or six drone, uh, surveillance whistleblowers. So there's a lot more information about each of them. So uh, we didn't reveal, we are not the first to reveal his story. Thank you so much. And I just had a question. You mentioned that there's drones in like 59 countries right now or something like I, that. I, so um, I'm not sure that we mentioned I, that. I, no, we didn't say yeah, that. Yeah. But, oh. yeah. but uh, like any other technology that's lethal that we've invented in this country, there's no way to control it once it's out of the bag. And at first it was Israel that was very far on the, on the cutting edge in this country in France and Great Britain, but now the Iranians are making their own drones. Uh, people that we would wish wouldn't be able to access that kind of technology are making their own drones. So I don't know whether there's an official number anywhere out there. More and more people are getting the, the use of these things. So, yeah, uh, Sorry. I, I, okay. there, is, there, are, there are some numbers. Uh, um, I don't remember off the top of my head, but um, I, I want to make a distinction between the drones you can buy um, right. at, a, at Radio Shack and, and these military drones. So these military drones are not available to very many countries. Of course, off-the-shelf drones are available to pretty much anyone, and even Al-Qaeda and Daesh, also known as ISIS, have uh, 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 drones that they use to spy on people and sometimes to drop little bombs. I've seen uh, I was in Lebanon, and I went to the Hezbollah Museum. Hezbollah has its own drone. So a lot of people have drones. These kinds of drones, in fact, are only in the hands of a very few countries. Uh, Israel, Britain, and the United States operate their own drones. And other countries, as, as Khalil mentioned, uh, collaborate with the US. France, for example, uh, uses US drones uh, uh, to kill people. So they send a list to people. There's a book in French, which I haven't read, but I think Khalil has read in which they explain how that happens. And there are attempts by Iran, at least I know about Iran, because a few weeks ago there was this incident where the Iranians had used some kind of pale copy of the Predator, if I remember. They had kind of made up their own version of the thing. So who knows? North, North Korea may have one. You know, these things, it's like, it's like the, the nuclear bomb. It was not supposed to, to go to the people we don't like, but it, it is happening. Everybody's getting one pretty soon, I mean. So there's no way for countries to stop the U.S. from bringing drones into their country? No, no that's, no, that's um, well, Jeez. technologically the drones could fly anywhere. There is one drone, I forget the name of the drone, that can fly halfway around the world. Um, and it's, it's based at the Beale Air Force Base near where we live. Um, so it is possible to fly a drone anywhere in the world. Typically, the U.S. operates un, uh, through something called a SOFA, Status of Forces Agreement. So typically, they operate drones in collaboration with host governments. It's rare that they uh, put drones over, let's say, I mean, maybe they do over North Korea. Certainly, they put it over Syria. But in most countries, there is an active collaboration. So for example, in uh, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, uh, uh, Yemen, Pakistan, Afghanistan, they have agreements with countries and they use the drones ostensibly uh, in collaboration with the governments to help them. So um, uh, using drones is an expensive and difficult procedure, partly because you have to launch the drones. The, the ones that fly halfway across the world are actually are not that useful. The ones that you, they use like the Predator and uh, what's the one after Predator? Um, uh, the Reaper. Uh, typically, have to be launched from bases close by, and they could be shot down. So, typically, so for example, the ones in Yemen are launched from Djibouti. The ones in Pakistan are launched uh, from Afghanistan. And there's more to launching uh, a drone than just launching it. You have to have all these teams in different places coordinating, in, in Florida and Nevada, and the 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 fly the the, the plane flying over the, the mountain. So it's not given to anybody. I mean, you, you, it, need, it requires quite a bit of sophistication. And as we've shown in, in this book, even that level of sophistication still fails so most of the time. Yeah. Well, the, the, the general public calls them drones. 
Uh, the industry likes to call them unmanned aerial vehicles, but the name I prefer is the military term, which is the most accurate. They call them the remotely RPAs, remotely piloted aircraft. Every drone, and we're talking about the small, the predator drones, which are the smallest, has a crew of 180 odd people. So these are not aircraft that are managed, they're not robots, they're actually involved a great deal of people, as, as Khalil said, and we show in the book, in Nevada and Florida, all over the place, in Afghanistan, launching the vehicles. We end with this, with this, this, uh, uh, this big the, map, this, yeah. this big map of where these, and, and we, we have this, I think, a fascinating image that, that Khalil created of the military industrial complex. And you see the Pentagon and, 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 and all the different systems. So another thing that I, I will give away um, partly because uh, I work for an organization called Corp Watch, and, and this is my job. Um, really, the, the secret in the book is not simply the, the, the fact that uh, there's a war. We know that war occur, uh, occurs. The secret is not the fact that innocent people get killed. The secret is that this is a very lucrative industry for dozens, in fact, hundreds of companies, such as one based in this state, which is Boeing, that make a lot of money uh, selling these kind, the, the equipment uh, 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 to kill people and profiting out of it. So, um, uh, yeah. I, so it's I, the, old, the, the good old military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us about in, in the 50s. It's, it's, it's as simple as that very often. It's just an amazing profit center selling this stuff, finding excuses to, to use it. So I'm curious, in addition to obviously the fascinating slash infuriating subject matter, um, about your process working together, um, coming up with this. It was neat to hear that it was your idea. Originally, then, yeah. Yeah, you brought so, him on and then yeah. and convinced him to become a protagonist. Yeah, exactly. So in the beginning, I told you I wanted to do something on the on uh, on these fantastic. To me, I admire these these whistleblowers. They will risk everything just out of it's, it's a, a moral obligation for them. And not many people these days are, are that courageous. And Anyway, so I, I talked, I called Protab, he was just coming back from London or from, yeah. yeah. You'd spent several years in London, he was back, welcome back. Glad to have you here in Berkeley, come on over. And I let the cat out of the bag, told him, I'd really like you to do this with me. I know you know this stuff, this is your beat, can we do it? And he said immediately, yes. Not really knowing, you know, what this, uh, we just had this, both of us, this vague idea on how to do it. And we started out clearly focused on Snowden and, and the other guys around him, the journalists, Laura Poitras, Glenn Greenwald, that was fun, documenting the amazing things they'd come up with. And then at some point, we ran into a wall. We wanted to talk more about the other side of it, the implication when it came to drone warfare, because it's the same technology, mass surveillance and its implications. And this we had to use Protap as our protagonist because he's the one that we're closest to that was really really knows what he's talking about and is constantly investigating as things happen in real time, making progress, finding out stuff. So it becomes really a book also about Protap's investigation that leads him to these these other whistleblowers who are not as well known at all, who are just simple soldiers who are have PTSD and can't stand it anymore. And we just got together on a regular basis and we had to redo a lot of stuff because we we're doing it in real time. And a lot of it had to be redone, redrawn, rewritten. It was a, quite an, a complicated process. How long was the process? <laughs> so about four years. Three, so and, a half, four years. three and a half okay. years, yeah, four yeah, years. I'll, yeah. I'll let you into a couple of little secrets. One is I had never read a graphic novel before I started this. Don't Clearly say that. doesn't want me to say that. Okay. And I'll let you in the novel. secret on him. He knows nothing about technology. Every time he used to print something, I have to go over to his house to show him how it works. He's exaggerating, so it was obviously. A good, it, it was a good collaboration in the sense that I knew about the technology. And, and he was... Basically, know, he was blind in some ways that I wasn't, yeah. and, and I, vice versa, yeah. I, the funny thing is, I have a degree in art. He has a degree in East Asian studies. Now, oh. He's got the degree in art, but I'm the artist, yeah. But so you also have a journalism I, I, degree. Yeah, I have, a, right. I have a diploma in journalism, and I have a master's in art. From and we had, collaborated, we had collaborated before the book for years, oh, okay. just on, because I'm also a political cartoonist. Right. 
and I was doing cartoons for Corp Watch, so he would throw oh, okay. stuff at me that was just cutting edge that I hadn't seen the day anywhere. These investigative stories right. about corporate malfeasance worldwide, and I would do cartoons for that, so we were used to working together. So we've done about a, before we started working on the book, we'd done about 100 cartoons. I'd write an article, I'd send it to him, and he'd mm -hmm. distill it into one panel. So this is a completely different endeavor because he was writing a whole book. So that was the, the whole challenge. How do you make sometimes very technical stuff, sometimes almost dry stuff kind of matter, how do you make it entertaining enough, visual enough, that people pick up the book and read it from, you know, from start to end? That was the challenge. How do you make something this ostensibly difficult and, and painful readable? And I think that's what we, at least we try to, to accomplish that. Are you liking it so far, having yeah. a book out of this nature a, and, a and using it's comics for journalism and all that? I, absolutely, L yeah. like I said. You would do it again? I would absolutely do it again. Mm -hmm. I, I've, I, I hadn't really read graphic novels, and I, I just think it's an amazing, uh, I mean, I've read comic books. Who hasn't read comic books? But I think it's an amazing opportunity uh, to get information out into a very different audience. I mean, my, a lot of my audience tends to be Older people, people who are intellectuals, and not to say that wonks, yeah. wonks. Mm. Um, and so this is a real opportunity to get this out into an audience of people, young people, particularly. Not that old people don't read comics. I mean, Khalil is not that young. Um, he's older than me, and I'm not that young. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, to me, I think what was I think it was. I, I when I started out, I was like, well, how do you write a graphic novel? You know, I I, I just had no idea. And eventually, I realized after that it was like writing a play or a movie script. And, and essentially, I took my stuff. We would meet every week, every Wednesday, I think it was. And I would tell him my stories. And then he'd say, OK, go away and write it up. And I wrote it up just like one would write you know, a, a play. And, and then I would send him dozens of images and say, this is actually what it looks like. And, and then I would have to rewrite it from scratch, of course, because right, it right. wasn't the right format. That's what I did with my previous uh, graphic novel, also Zara's Paradise. I had a very good uh, uh, partner who would write the stuff, and I would adapt it. Uh, I felt a little bit, I always feel a little bit like a, a movie maker with a script writer who, who has a good script. I have to turn it into a film, I, I mean, in my case, a graphic novel, because a lot of this stuff that Protap is used to writing has to be very accurate and very dispassionate. And I have to turn it into something a little bit more uh, emotional, a little more real, so people can, can uh, relate to it. So wherever he's trying to take out the emotion, I'm trying to put it back. So that was the real, the real challenge between the two of us. We had completely different missions. His mission was accuracy, and my mission was like, forget accuracy. I want to make it interesting. So that, that was not always easy to combine the two into this graphics this uh, comics journalism, as they call it, which was, by the way, invented by a guy down the road from you guys in, in Portland, Joe Sacco. Wherever my books are out now, always, there's always a Sacco book next to it because it's considered the same genre. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm so, excited yeah. to read it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hope you enjoy it. Thank you for coming. Um, I wonder, you, you said much of this technology was like nascent seven to ten years ago. What do you think happens in the next five years in mass surveillance in particular? Thank you. Well, well, there's two ways of approaching that question. One is uh, uh, what, will ha uh, uh, what will the governments do and what will the people and uh, activists uh, do? So post-Snowden, uh, there has been a tremendous learning process for the companies that make this technology. Uh, and a lot of them have uh, um, taken it upon themselves to uh, change the way they operate. So starting with Signal, which was encrypted uh, text conversations, now WhatsApp uh, and Go uh, Google and people like that are providing uh, encrypted uh, browsers and encrypted, they're not 100% encrypted, uh, because the brow, uh, as I mentioned before. So I think there's certainly been an evolution in terms of the makers of the technology and the users of the technology demanding it. I do see that uh, 
people are, going to, are getting much more sophisticated about how they use technology. And um, uh, I'm as constantly astonished at the number of people that use Signal and encrypted technology that didn't before. So I think there are, in the next few years, I think there will be, I hope there will be a lot more people working uh, to build better, more uh, uh, encrypted systems and more people using them. So that's one part of it. The other is, of course, the NSA and the CIA and people like that are going to do their damnedest to try and break into these systems. So the thing that I worry about most and I've been thinking about in the last few weeks is that, in fact, this technology, forget about drones. Actually, you, uh, you could use a drone to uh, launch uh, anthrax over uh, a neighbor. And, and somebody's actually done that in Japan. There's a man who actually put de-weaponized anthrax and flew it over the house of the, 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 the Japanese prime minister. So that sort of thing could happen. But in fact, the technology we're talking about now is actually in the hands of anybody who's smart enough to be able to use it that forget about governments, individuals can use it to weaponize uh, all the systems that we use, power plants, dams, nuclear uh, uh, sites. It is possible, and we explain this in the book, to dig into the flaws in the technology we use every day, like PDF or Word or whatever, to use that to be able to use these weapons against us. So the thing that I'm really terrified about, and this is how the book ends, is that um, using flaws in our everyday technology, it's possible to turn you know, our own equipment against us. And so if you, if you, if you turn your house, I'm never going to do this. I'm never going to have an intelligent house with Nest or whatever because it can be used against you. So this is really kind of terrifying. And it's not just, I, just, I read this article, I, I forget in what newspaper, probably the New York Times the other day, how North Korea is really creating an army of people, to, uh, of hackers, whom they're sending to China, to learn how to use these systems against us. So you, you're reading in the news about you know, how Russia has infiltrated, I think some of this is, a lot of this is exaggerated, but it is certainly something that's possible in the future is anybody anywhere, I mean, think about it. Julian Assange is one person sitting in a room where he's often cut off from the internet. If he's able to get hold of information from governments, what about somebody who's not as responsible and takes that information and can use it against us? So that is the evolution that I'm worried about, is uh, state actors and non-state actors can take our technology and use it against us. And so it's really up to us you know, to fight back and to say this is this is not a good thing. And, and the only way we're going to be able to do it is we're going to have to work with whistleblowers, with you know, soldiers, uh, people in the government. You know, we've got to team up with them and, and, take, and you know, have their back. Yeah. So that's my I think we're prediction. Just about the right time oh, are we? Uh, All right. Hi, I'm Lexi with Town Hall. I'm your event lead for tonight. Um, thank you so much again, Khalil and Pratip. Um, for presenting today. Let's give a big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And now that we're done with questions, uh, well, there's books available from Third Place uh, Books if you want to buy a copy, and then they'll have signing at the table right next door. So thank you all so much from Town Hall for being here tonight. And feel free to come up and ask us more questions.